I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Julie Kohler. Julie is a writer, an activist, and host of the podcast, White Picket Fence. White Picket Fence is a podcast which interrogates the structures of inequity affecting women since America's founding. In our conversation, Julie and I will examine how motherhood has been utilized for political gain and why the identity of mother remains so politically potent. We also talk about how conservatives have escalated their political narratives to dangerous new levels by injecting more and more violent rhetoric. And it's often done all in the name of motherhood. And not only are these narratives dangerous, but they're also false, particularly because when conservatives talk about motherhood and families, they aren't talking about all mothers and all families. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Julie Kohler. Julie Kohler, welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you. So let's talk about motherhood and the ways that it's weaved into political narratives. You know, over the past few major election cycles, I have personally been surprised and a bit dismayed (laughs) at the creative ways in which motherhood and the images and the narratives around motherhood have been deployed. And I'm specifically thinking about the way that conservatives, just to start off, the way that they've deployed motherhood. And they've used it in a way to essentially diminish the rights of nearly everyone. But nearly everyone except, I guess, white men, right? And I'm curious if there's anything different about this moment, in your opinion, that has kind of shocked you in comparison to how motherhood's been used and those narratives have been used throughout history to weaponize the narrative? Yeah. Well, I think that they are pulling a play from a very old playbook. And so on one level, no, I'm not surprised. This season on my podcast, which is called White Picket Fence, we really go into sort of the resurrection of this particular type of conservative, overwhelmingly white mothers organizing as exemplified by groups like Moms for Liberty that have really been organizing in order to, you know, dramatically restrict the curriculum in public schools, to erode LGBTQ rights, to uh, whitewash history, so to speak, by banning books and, 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 and really inverting sort of a a narrative about greater diversity, equity, and inclusion in public schools into one that is somehow, you know, that they claim is, is, is an assault on their parental rights. So we've seen that kind of conservative white mother organizing for really the better part of 60, 70 years. And we trace its origins in the podcast back into, you know, kind of the early days of the conservative movement where this emerging kind of mother in the 1950s, 1960s, white, middle class, in the suburbs, stay-at-home mother, kind of got professionalized as a housewife and got really, played a really important role in the emergence of the modern day conservative movement. A lot of what they were organizing around at the time was really, you know, they talked about it in terms of being anti-communist and trying to weed out communism from their own communities and kind of being the eyes and ears, um, protecting their children from these subversive forces. But the rhetoric is eerily familiar to what we're hearing today. You know, what they were actually organizing against was not, by and large, communism. It was more progressive forces in education. It was integration in public education. And so we're seeing sort of this white backlash movement that is once again resurgent at this moment, kind of using the veneer of motherhood in order to advance its aims. I think what is different now than, you know, in the 1950s and 60s when when sort of these suburban housewives were kind of, Lisa McGurr, the historian from Harvard that we interview in, in one of the episodes, talks about them as suburban warriors. And I think is different this time around from back then is that in the 1950s and 60s, there was a, an authentic grassroots movement. And I think what we're seeing now with groups like Moms for Liberty you know, they've been able to tap into some frustration that I think 
a, a lot of parents felt in the wake of the pandemic with, you know, all the, all the responsibilities that have been heaped on our, our shoulders and, and just the logistical challenges of parenting and, and managing school amidst school closures. But by and large, this is not a widespread grassroots movement. What it is, is a very, very savvy communications operation. And, you know, Moms for Liberty has deep and extensive relationships with a lot of powerful conservative actors, both in the state of Florida, with their extensive relationships with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and many in his administration, as well as nationally. We chronicle, for example, the extensive relationships and the ways that Moms for Liberty has benefited through their connections with the Leadership Institute, kind of a conservative training ground a $30 million operation that's kind of the talent scout of the conservative movement and has given Moms for Liberty all sorts of resources and trainings and, and access to conservative media megaphones. So I think, you know, given kind of what these conservatives saw as the utility of deploying this veneer of motherhood and how that has worked for them in the past, they were able to organize what is today really more of an astroturf movement than the, than an authentic grassroots movement, but been able to s- manipulate that very strategically in order to make it seem like a very powerful force in modern politics. You know, I think one of the things that has surprised me when I think back on how this has been used historically is, you know, currently it seems really violent to me and openly violent. You know, you see people running for office who are posting photos, mothers carrying weapons of war. And I think that it was Sarah Palin who first popularized that that phrase, you know, mama bear, which I think is a really interesting phrase. You know, all the while, of course, she was, you know, hunting animals from her helicopter. (laughs) I think Carrie Lake also used the phrase mama bear. And I think that that imagery is really interesting because they are kind of, in a way, giving permission to be violent in the name of protecting children while the conservative party is kind of inventing the risks to children, right? Haven't seen it before used in these kind of legitimate political messages and ads, right? Like you see with Lauren Bobert, for instance, you know, sending out postcards of herself carrying, again, you know, these weapons of war. Is that something that we've seen before in the past? Well, I think you're right in that it has gotten more and more violent, the imagery and and actually the tactics too. You know, we, in the first episode of this season of the podcast, we interview a school board member in Brevard County, Florida, Jennifer Jenkins. And she says she apologizes to America because when she was elected to school board in 2020, the woman she defeated, Tina Deskovich, who was an incumbent school board member in Brevard County, Florida, she then went on to co-found, to be one of the co-founders of Moms for Liberty in the wake of her defeat. But what Jennifer Jenkins experienced after winning election is really frightening and harrowing. I mean, you know, what moms, their tactics that they originally deployed, both were, you know, kind of the tactics that we saw nationally when this was first kind of emerging, right? The disruption at at school board meetings, the harassment of school board members, just the, you know, kind of the the chaos and the, you know, and, and, and making these and just being these loud kind of abusive voices. But she ex- experienced very extreme personal harassment, members of the community showing up on her yard brandishing weapons in her neighborhood, uh, filing false allegations of child abuse with the Department of Children and Families. And she finally spoke out publicly about the tremendously extreme harassment and abuse that she was experiencing. And some of that quieted down in in the wake of her going public. But I think this you know, we are entering a period of time where I think political violence is becoming more and more common and more and more mainstream, especially among, you know, the the, the right wing, the, the, the political right in our country. And using this imagery of 
mothers and mama bears or Sarah Palin's mama grizzlies, that imagery to justify political violence, I think is something that is new and is extremely disturbing and is something that we have to really fight to reclaim pretty aggressively to be able to say, this is not what motherhood means to me. This is not the, you know, a vision of motherhood that I agree with or I endorse. I believe that the vast majority of people in this country and the vast majority of mothers in this country, while we may feel passionately protective of our children, we wouldn't, we do not endorse the violent, abusive, harassing images or behavior that we've seen deployed by the right. 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 I do feel passionately protective of my children. I've never attacked anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just so aberrant to me. Anyway, you know, I think that we can trace this recent escalation because I think there has been a really sharp escalation over the past, you know, five years. Um, Back to the 2016 campaign, actually, even before the 2016 election, there was Pizzagate where, you know, this person went into this pizza place based on these conspiracy theories that children were being abused. Um, You know, even though, you know, he wasn't a mother, it's kind of in the same realm of protecting children because mothers protect children. But Trump in particular on his campaign trail, but even before he was elected, you know, he leaned into a lot of those longstanding dog whistles around, you know, immigrants, for instance, and the need to protect suburban families and suburban women. And, you know, we talk about that and the backlash, you know, from women following that campaign, you know, the Women's March, the pink wave, all of the women elected to Congress. But we don't talk enough about the fact that in many, many ways that rhetoric worked, because if you look at the demographics, there is a certain group of women who have continued to move right based on, I'm assuming, that rhetoric, right? You know, there's white women in particular. I don't know if it's suburban white women. I don't have the demographic breakdown, but they have not really moved away from conservatives. And I don't know what we can attribute that to. Yeah, well, I think I think there's been several factors that have really contributed to the ongoing split that we see among white women's voting patterns. I mean, I think overall the data show that kind of the, you know, white women remain slightly Republican in their political leanings on average with, you know, pretty meaningful distinctions based on several factors, based on age, based on marital status, based on area of the country with rural white women being the most conservative block of white women voters based on educational level, based on religion. So we do see, you know, different differences within different subgroups. But yeah, overall, we've seen kind of a a narrow majority of white women favoring Republican candidates. And that's been for the better part of, you know, several decades. I think that what has happened to escalate this are, you know, a number of really concerning forces that have, you know, converged. One is the rapid spread of disinformation and misinformation online. And so that more and more people are getting, you know, really radicalized by intentionally misleading sources. And I think that they have been very effective, unfortunately, in targeting, you know, certain segments of the population that may have been conservative leaning, but have become far more conservative over the last several years. And so even if you look at you know, the the spread of conspiracy theories in QAnon and the way that QAnon was marketed to a lot of mostly white women through this kind of save the children um, rhetoric that they were using and messaging. Yeah. And they'd kind of suck women in, you know, who like, of course, you know, who doesn't oppose child sex trafficking, but right. then brings them into these really extreme radical, you know, completely false conspiracy theories. You know, it's really alarming. And you're right. It has led to political violence. You know, Pizzagate, that took place at a pizza parlor that's about two blocks from my house. And I was with my then toddler son in the shop next door just mere hours before it happened. So, you know, this feels very personal to me. This feels very personal, I think, to all of us that, in the name of protecting children, they are radicalizing and they are, and they are, we are now seeing 
an increase in violence that frankly puts all of us at risk, all of our children, all of our communities. And I think we have to be really vigilant and active in once again saying these women do not speak for the majority of mothers and they certainly do not speak for me. Well, I I didn't know that story about you being near, nearby Pizzagate. When that happened, that must have rattled you. I mean, it would have rattled me. I mean, I'm constantly on edge thinking about the possibility of political violence, you know, with this in this climate. Yeah, it was, it's terrifying. I mean, I, I really, I've never seen anything like that in my neighborhood. There were just, you know, I remember being home with my toddler son just a couple hours after we had been out and about and seeing, you know, police cars just flooding the neighborhood and being, you know, in a state of, you know, complete confusion as to what was going on. So yeah, it brings it home. None of us are immune from these forces and, uh, you know, it makes all of us very vulnerable. Now, speaking of misinformation and disinformation around child sex trafficking, I think there's a link there to something else I think that is new for me in this in this messaging are the attacks on the LGBTQ community and the trans community. I don't think we've seen that historically linking that specifically to mothers and the need to protect children. So conservatives have always been homophobic. They've always been anti-LGBTQ. But there's a new level to this, I think, right? And, and I'm curious as to what you make of that. And, and who are they hoping to reach with, you know, by making connections to motherhood and their anti-LGBTQ messaging? Yeah, I wish it were totally new. Unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> you know, when, I don't know if you remember reading about Anita Bryant and her Save the Children campaign in the 1970s in Florida. But that was an anti-LGBTQ backlash movement at that time. And it was all done with the, you know, the with the face of this, you know, white mother of, I think she had four children. And it was all done in the supposed protection of children and really caused some very meaningful rollbacks in at that time mostly anti-gay rights, um, but now has been morphed into mostly anti-trans, but really a broad assault on LGBTQ rights. So again, I don't think it's, it's a new tactic, but I would say the cruelty of the current, of the current legislation is really striking. And it is such a contrast from where we have been going in terms of greater acceptance of LGBTQ rights in this country over the last really, you know, several decades, that it is just, I think for many of us, it is it is really alarming and shocking to see this come back with such a vengeance. But unfortunately, they are able to build on some history of that kind of activism being done with sort of the same rhetoric and with sort of, again, the face of, of white motherhood really being the justification for the, the, the cruel legislation. No, you're absolutely right. What am I thinking? That, that piece of it isn't new. You know, I think what is possibly different is, you know, the attacks on the trans community in that, you know, they're also saying what's at risk are, you know, children who are trans, right? This kind of gaslighting saying that, you know, those children are at risk as well yeah. <laughs> when when they when they aren't. Right. So it's a, a new layer of of scare tactics. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with you completely. And this whole conversation reminds me of that famous Toni Morrison interview where she talks about white mothers during the civil rights movement who were against um, school desegregation. I don't know if you if you're familiar with that. Absolutely. That, that interview, right, where she talks about, you know, the, I mean, the gist of the interview was how, you know, white mothers were essentially violent, right? They were trying to turn over school buses. They were trying to, you know, set school buses on fire, school buses that had, you know, black children in them, black children being spat at or they're walking to school, little children, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, and how she said she could not, you know, she she could not think of any black woman or any group of black women that she could convince to harm white children and to burn buses, Right. And I don't, I was watching that again last night when I was thinking about our conversation and I, I don't have any easy answer for, for why that is, right? Like why white mothers are such a perfect vector for political weaponization. Yeah, I, I know it is. It's very depressing, quite frankly, <laughs> when you look over, over the, the decades of this kind of, this kind of how successful they've frankly been in, in activating white motherhood and protection of, you know, the racist status quo in you know, now and sort of this anti-LGBTQ backlash. And I mean, I think it really comes down to 
I guess it's as simple as just how how powerful that desire to protect racial privilege can be, unfortunately, and still is, or, you know, privilege based on, you know, any number of factors, right? Sexual orientation, gender identity, race, et cetera. And, you know, it's just really something, I guess, to see <laughs> something that's such an inadequate word. It's really frightening to see that that the use of parental rights being kind of the the way that they try to encourage this form of activism because of course the question is whose rights and it's it's really sort of the most extreme uh, example of white fragility right i i will fight to protect the right of myself not to feel in any way uncomfortable even if it means you know, sub- subjugating, however, you know, denying the humanity, the rights of so many others, including so many other children. So, you know, I think all we can do is continue to educate and push and to do our work with our people and our communities and be having the conversations and be constantly pushing on whose rights, you know, and 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 how we all benefit from accurate school public school curriculum historically accurate public school curriculum from diversity inclusion equity initiatives that all of these things benefit us all and we have to really demonstrate those impacts in over in order to push push through the fear So I will I will move on to some of the good things that are happening. Yes, but <laughs> but, okay, but I'll say this. I, I just want to comment on this last thing that you said that, you know, just piggyback on this piece of the conversation is that um, you hinted at the fact that, you know, there are other mothers like those children on those school buses. They have mothers. Yes. <laughs> you know, there are black mothers or Latino mothers or Asian mothers or other mothers out there. You know, but when conservatives say mother, they don't mean those women. That's right. right. So I'll, I'll just close on that. But That's um, right. <laughs> so some of the good things, right, because, you know, activism and motherhood can be used for good. And I'm curious as to what ways you've seen that in the past, over the past few years during the Biden administration. I know he signed some really positive bills into law, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which I think goes into effect this summer. Um, and yeah. there's another one. What, what do you take? What's your what's your take? <laughs> well, yes. And so this is where we do a bit of a pivot in our season of the podcast and say <laughs> that just as motherhood has been weaponized in some really destructive ways, motherhood has also been a political force for greater justice throughout history. And, you know, we have, for example, most of our social safety net in this country or much of our social safety net was the result of a lot of mothers, women and mothers, political activism in the progressive era. We continue to see that. And, you know, I think it is no coincidence that we see this backlash movement, the Moms for Liberty type groups coming up in the wake of the pandemic, when there was such a huge mobilization of mothers and women on behalf of what was called, you know, all the kind of care economy policies that went into was at that time called the Build Back Better Act. Eventually, unfortunately, they did not make it into the Inflation Reduction Act. But that activism has not gone away for things like greater public investment in child care, for paid f- paid family and medical leave, for an expanded child tax credit that had an enormous effect in reducing child poverty and making family life easier for the vast majority of American families. So we are seeing, and then frankly, you know, in the, in the movement against gun violence and against police violence and the use of violence in, you know, by both police and really on behalf of the state, especially in communities of color and especially in black communities. So, you know, from anything from moms demand action to the mothers of the movement whose children have been victims of police violence but have refused to let their children's deaths, you know, go in vain and have broken through and, you know, brought massive new public awareness of this problem. And, you know, and we're starting to see 
you know, some more energy around addressing them. And so, I, you know, there's been just an incredibly long and robust history of women being motivated through their identities as mothers and tapping into that as a source of activism and as a way to really advance justice. And I have no doubt that that will continue. I think what we have to work at on the progressive side is frankly ensuring that we center the most marginalized mothers in that activism. Because when we do, we see solutions that actually benefit all of us. And unfortunately, and this will probably not be a surprise to you or any of your listeners, you know, the progressive movement over time has had to deal with race and class and discrimination that have plagued society as a whole. So, you know, the, you know, progressive mothers, especially white progressive mothers have not been immune from that either. But when we have solutions that really have been um, developed by and being driven by those mothers who have been most marginalized, we really see solutions that will make our society vastly better for all families. And so we interview many of those activists this season on the podcast as well, groups like Mothering Justice in Detroit that have a really, you know, a truly encompassing mama's agenda that is centered in you know black communities and other communities of color in Detroit and has really grown statewide and now is expanding nationally and when we focus on uplifting that kind of activism i really think the potential of what we can accomplish is really endless right and you know i'm so glad you mentioned moms demand action right that's been one of my <laughs> you know one of my favorite groups and you know Shannon Watts and the incredible work that she's done can't forget that and also Lucy McBath Right. Exactly. Um, Lucy McBath, her son was killed by a gun violence and, you know, she became an activist and now she's in Congress. So that's a way that motherhood can be deployed for, for good. And you mentioned paid leave. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, you know, that was not kind of a household concept. That was not a part of our daily political debate, right? Thinking about paid leave broadly. And of course, we can't forget the work that Vice President Kamala Harris has done on trying to reduce maternal mortality and mor morbidity and to protect Black mothers from, from medical bias. So all of these things are positive and they've kind of been born out of the positive narratives around, around motherhood that unfortunately right now only Democrats and progressives are, are, are using. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I think that there's lots of possibility and lots of potential. And I think one of what I think is really important about this strand of mother's activism is that these activists are refusing to cede the identity and cede the ground of motherhood to the right, right? Like, I mean, to be able to say, you know, <laughs> I am also a mother and my my identity of my of motherhood makes me want to advocate for solutions that will help all children and all families, not just my own child. So I think that that is really important to have in the public view. I think one of the things that we do have to grapple with on the on the you know left on the political left is who does that exclude and do you know by by centering motherhood in our political discourse does it send a message that women sort of have the right to political agency only through their motherhood identities and. Look, I don't think that there's kind of a right or wrong answer to this. I think uh, it is both useful and there are ways that it can probably encourage a form of biological essentialism that isn't terribly helpful. So I think what we have to just be really clear about is being very intentional in how we deploy it and be intentional and inclusive to be also saying that it's not only mom's moms, you know, many of us as moms really do care about gun violence and its corrosive effects on our communities, but you don't have to be a mom in order to be concerned about gun no. violence in our country. And so, although it's great to sort of tap into that, that 
identity in order to build a base of people who are willing to take action. I think we also need to be finding ways, and I think Shannon's been very intentional about this and in, in you know building alliances with with other with other folks who care a lot about these issues. I also say that this is something that all all members of a society, all members of our community can be really activated on and have a right to a public voice on. Right. And they really should be. They really should be. I am really excited about your upcoming season. When does it start? And is there a particular conversation that you're really excited about? Yeah. Oh, there's so many that I'm really excited about. <laughs> so we launched on International Women's Day, March 8th, with the first episode and new episodes are dropping weekly every Wednesday. There, I, I can't pick a favorite. We actually we I talked know. to Shannon. We talked to Shannon Watts, who's amazing. We talked to Danielle Atkinson from Mothering Justice. We talked to so many inspiring activists who are using that identity for good. And we also talked to, you know, a lot of folks who had unique insights into the ways that motherhood is being weaponized. So we spoke to Jennifer Jenkins, the school board member in Brevard County, Florida, who I referenced earlier. We spoke to Representative Michelle Rayner, who is the first openly queer Black woman state legislator in the state of Florida and is on the front lines of fighting back against this extremist agenda that Moms for Liberty has partnered with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his Republican supermajority in the legislature to advance. And, you know, I think she really had some great inspirational words, you know, like she was, she said to all of us, like, I get it. We, this is fatiguing, right? This is really hard. But if she can be in the position that she is in, in, you know, in a democratic minority in the Florida state legislature and still be carrying out the fight, then all of us can be in this fight. And I think it was a great reminder, once again, that they are counting on a majority in this country becoming fatigued. And we just simply cannot let that happen. We cannot let the loudest, the most extreme, the most aggressive, the most violent voices prevail. We need to mobilize what is indeed, I believe, a real majority in this country to be able to advance a very different agenda and to be able to evoke a very different image of motherhood in support of that agenda. Wow. I, I am very excited to catch to catch up on your episodes. Wow. You're so, so right. We can't stop. Well, Julie Kohler, thank you so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And, and again, I have to catch up on your episodes. So thank you again. Oh, thanks so much, Jen. It's always great being with you.